Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, coming at you from Macomb, Illinois. And we have got a throwback show for you today, folks. It is the unaired pilot episode of Good Growing. And I am not here by myself, folks. I need all the help I can get. As usual, we are joined by local foods educator, Katie Parker in Quincy. Hey, Katie. Hey, Chris. How are you doing? I'm doing I'm doing great. You know, back from vacation, missed out on an amazing snowstorm that you guys had. About to have another one here as we record. So I'm excited at least. How about you? Yeah, I think it's time for you to go back to Florida so that we can ensure we'll get some snow. I I will say Florida ruined us for winter. We came, we had be- absolutely beautiful weather. Uh, 80s for the high um uh, and like 60s for the low we were there though when we started the night they had their freeze and like iguanas were dropping out of trees and stuff so uh it was cold that night but otherwise it totally ruined us for illinois winter we came back and we're like we're tired of winter now we're, we're done with this we want we want warm weather weather back well i do feel like our days are getting longer which is nice at least that's a positive with our illinois winter weather Exactly. And we're going to have so much to talk about in the coming weeks on this show as our days get longer and starting to get warmer. I am getting totally stoked for gardening this year. Yeah, it's definitely an exciting time. And someone who I know is really excited for gardening and boy, sure does wish he was in Florida still. Horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville. Hey, Ken. I'm not sure about wishing I was in Florida. 80, 80 degrees in January and February. No bueno. Hey, it was a good break from the winter, but no, I definitely wouldn't want to be the 80 degrees. If that's the winter, the summer, mm-mm, no, wouldn't be terrible. <laughs> Can just move to the Midwest for a summer. Definitely, yeah. Although it's pretty, it's pretty humid here too. Yeah, we got the whole Mississippi River and corn sweat thing going on here. So we got we got our own humidity issue woes, I would say. Not as bad as Florida, though. I, you'll you'll I never would. convince me otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was really interesting when we were there the first day they got that almost record setting uh, freeze there uh, with, uh, you know, the lizard dropping warnings and all of that stuff. And so I actually went out the next day and I took pictures of, I think their azaleas were going to be blooming soon. I'm not sure. Of course, obviously I don't live there, so I don't like quite know the timing, but there was blooming of the azaleas happening inside the shrub and in the interior of the shrub, but you could see the frost damage, all the brown tips of the leaves. And I, flower buds and everything so that was just there was a lot of stuff that did get damaged um but it's just so green and lush there it's hard to notice there you had to really kind of look yeah it was probably sounds about right for azalea time yeah there. Oh, shoot i missed out on that so oh well oh well we have azaleas to look forward to here as well so uh well katie ken um i know ken you thought a long time ago you were the first guest on the show and you definitely were the first guest on the show, but did you know I did a pilot episode? <laughs> I didn't. I feel like I've been living a lie all these years. <laughs> oh, don't say that. Oh. <laughs> the show's going to break up now because I'm so angry. <laughs> I thought I thought this was going to be a great show. We're going to this unaired episode, and it's, it's the downfall of us all. Well, I back long time ago. I mean, this was like 2017, I think. Um, I got this brand new microphone, um, that I'm using right now to record. And I'm like, how do I use this thing? And so I invited our then family life educator, uh, her name's Kara Allen. She's since retired, uh, since we've done this, but, um, Kara is very much an avid gardener too. And so I wanted to sit down and talk with her because she knows a lot of the research on the benefits of nature, gardening, being outdoors for humans, whether it is of emotional health or physical health. So I brought Kara into my office. We sat down across from each other and I recorded our conversation. And that, that's what a podcast is, right? Well, um, turns out I didn't know how to use my microphone. And so um, listeners, if you are going to be listening to this, I'm sorry. Um, it's going to be a little off. I will do my best in editing to fix the sound levels, but Kara's going to be a little faint because I didn't realize 
had that I could set my microphone like different ways. And so I thought it was correct, but it wasn't. So anyway, but yeah, uh, Ken, Katie, um, yeah, we're going to dive into this uh, conversation here with Kara Allen, a retired family life educator about nature and its impact on the human body. Hello, my name is Chris Enroth. I'm your host. Uh, this is the Green Speak podcast. It's our maiden voyage here, and I'm a horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension, and uh, I don't want to do this alone, so we brought in today a colleague of mine, Kara Allen, family life educator. So welcome to the podcast, Kara. Happy to have you here. Thank you, Chris. And you said it's the maiden voyage, so let's hope it's not a three-hour tour that turns into a how-many-year uh, a up debacle, to yes. Yeah, <laughs> yes. Well, hopefully, it, well, a three-hour tour would be nice, and it, it would be great if we could extend this on for years and years, different seasons okay. and so on. But, uh, yeah, we, we would like to keep this down to at least, like, 20 minutes. Okay. All if right. we could, like, no no three-hour tour. Sorry, Gilligan. Uh, not going to happen here. We'll see how the USS Minnow goes. Though. Okay. Because, you know, family life educators say we can talk about our big toe for three hours if we need to. <laughs> so just if you need to give me the hook, give me the hook. That's great. All right. Okay. Awesome. So, Kara, you're a family life educator. Can you describe that a little bit besides talking about big toes? Okay. Uh, family life educators focus on two main areas. We focus on... Uh, early childhood development, with, we really focus on educating child care providers in order to hopefully improve the quality of care that children receive. Child care providers have a wide range of educational needs that they have to comply with to maintain their licensure, so we try to meet that need for them. And then um, what we're also known for is what we call healthy living. We focus on adults, especially older adults, and we talk about um, how to age positively, how to age healthfully, and what we really hang our hat on is brain health um, and teaching people those things that they can do to keep their brain healthy as they age. So th this podcast is going to be, you know, our main topic is gardening, landscaping, growing food crops, farming, um, but brain health is really important. And when I just uh, read a recent study about, um, you know, brain health and minimizing uh, effects of dementia and Alzheimer's when you get older, they're talking about getting outside and being active, like exercise and gardening is a, a primary uh, activity that they recommend. So yes. is that true? It is true. Gardening, although, you know, you don't think of it this way, is actually considered a moderate level of activity between the stooping, the bending, the reaching, all of those things, no matter whether you're doing container gardening, have a garden plot, work in your yard, and um, it's recommended a minimum of, well, they recommend 30 minutes of moderate level activity most days. So if you're an avid gardener, you've got it all taken care of. The other thing with gardening is if you do gardening with other people, like when we do master gardeners, socialization is also a huge protective factor against dementia and Alzheimer's, which by the way, Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. And so I tend yeah. to use those terms intermingled and that's not necessarily correct. But socialization is one of the big six also. So whenever you're doing something like that in a group or you're doing things where you are donating your produce, like we have a, I'm not sure the exact term, but we have a grant from SNAP-Ed, correct? That's to, correct, yeah. Yes, to do some donations to food pantries. That's also a, a huge brain health contributor. Excellent. And so getting folks interested in gardening, um, you know, it, it, it seems like from my standpoint, um, you know, my background's in the green industry, uh, landscape architecture, landscape design, uh, maintenance, installation, uh, and, and even farming, you know, uh, from the big scale to the small scale fruit and vegetable growers. A lot of them as children were exposed quite a bit to the outdoors. Do, so do you see that in terms of, you know, developing habits and, you know, patterns in people's lives? Is being outside as a child, is that, does that feed into what we want to do or be as adults? Well, I can't speak to research, but I can speak for myself. I'm a country girl myself, and uh, 
we were, my parents were avid gardeners, and so we all had our chores that we had to do in the garden, and my mother did all the canning, all the preserving, all the freezing. She didn't do drying. That wasn't a thing then. <laughs> um, that's that's a new thing. Yes. Um, we didn't have fruit roll-ups back, back when I was a kid. And um, this is probably not what you want to hear, but actually I didn't like gardening when I was a kid because it was a requirement. But as I got older, then for some reason that interest was was sparked again. And I do think that it had to do with that. You know, just the taste of the vegetables, I wanted to go back to that. Um, I have a personal goal myself of I, what I call vegetable self-sufficiency, so that I grow all my own, preserve all my own, can all my own, so that I don't have to, so that I know how it was grown, the source of it, the healthfulness of it. And I also then know that it wasn't transported 1,500 miles to get here for me to consume. Yes, I can totally relate to your your kind of not wanting to be out in the garden as a kid. So as a kid, when I was growing up, my parents, we had... Um, we were also out in the country, uh, so that means I didn't really have TV. We had three stations, NBC. We had two. Yeah, yeah, and, and ours was NBC, CBS, and sometimes ABC would come in. <laughs> Fuzzy, not very, not very well, but yes. Um, so we had, we, we we didn't have the most entertainment value from yes. the, the television. So that meant we had to go outside. Um, and I'm and I grew up in the '80s and '90s. So, I, like, I guess I'm just one of those odd, oddballs who, when someone's talking about Nickelodeon cartoons from their nostalgic years, I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about, sorry. Um, but in the garden, I remember it being, like, middle of July, super hot. The, the soil would be crusted over yes. and cracking, and I would be hauling buckets of water to these tomato plants, which were barely hanging on. Yep. Um, and I just remembered really not liking it. Um, and... And I spent actually probably more of my time, I would escape the garden and probably go uh, out in the woods, uh, play down in the creek, um, you know, pretty much endless hours of entertainment there with rocks, logs, building bridges, things like that. That was me, dams, you know, mm -hmm. then building it so that you could try to catch the minnows um, on Sunday afternoons. That was my brother and my dad and my time to go for a walk and go out in the country and go to the creek and... Um, and creek, not crick. Mm -hmm, that's right. Go to the creek and just mess around and spend hours there. And probably like you, we did. My closest neighbor was a half mile away, so you know you didn't have that opportunity to do a lot of. You know, we didn't do a lot of pickup baseball games or anything like that. Again, we were kind of left to our own devices. Mm -hmm, exactly. Now, now I live in town, and we're surrounded by people, and my, my children want to go play outside with the neighbor kids. I'm like, how does this work? <laughs> uh, do we do we have to, like, call them first? Or, like, uh, you got to arrange this whole thing? But, no, you can just walk over and show just up. start yeah. playing with each other. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, very interesting. And, like, and I didn't really – think much of it as a kid playing outside, working in the garden. But, and, and, and I also, in my kind of adolescence, I went into computers and I found those more interesting. Uh -huh. um, so, you know, learning how to like code HTML and build websites and all that kind of yes, stuff. Sure. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it, but it wasn't until like I had to decide on a career. I'm like, well, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't start with horticulture either. Um, but it's eventually where I landed. And I, when I think back on it, I'm, it just seems obvious. Like, of course, I right. spent my, my youth outside. Right. That only makes sense that I want to spend my adult life right. also working outside, um, getting my hands dirty, and just trying to cultivate a little bit of a better, better world. Mm -hmm. Yes. And my career choice, I don't think, was affected by my early experiences. However, where I live now certainly is. I moved around quite a bit as an adult, um, you know, uh, always in a town somewhere and was never quite satisfied with it. And so when I moved to this area for a job, for this job, I swore to myself I would live in the country. And I remember very clearly getting out of the car at you know, to view the house that I live in now. And I got out of the car. It was like late spring and I could hear the red winged blackbirds and I could hear the frogs. And I thought to myself, this sounds exactly like home. 
and that was the house I wanted. That's the house I have now. This is the house I've lived in the longest at all in my adult life and want to live there until they, until it's time for me not to be able to take care of myself yes, anymore. Yes. So yes, mm -hmm. yes. My neighbor said she wanted to live in her house until she was taken out on a slab. I'm not quite saying <laughs> that, but uh, I understand the, the thought process there. Uh, and this is the happiest I've ever been where I've lived. Wonderful. No, I, and I, I feel the same way. Um, you know, I never really thought I would end up in a job with extension as a horticulture educator. Um, I, I started school in my college career and criminal justice. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't seem to really fit my personality when I look back onto it, but, um, it was, I came to a point when we were in our criminology class and I was learning about just why people are criminals and why they do what they do. And it was not because they're these vicious, angry people. It's because something terrible happened to them um, growing up or, you know, sometime in their life. And I just said, you know, I don't think I have the mindset to deal with this. And so I switched to plants, which, you know, don't want to hurt me. But for the most part, some plants, eh, they're not right. so nice. But, right. um, but I, I really did find my place, you know, Getting back outside, getting my hands dirty, getting involved um, in, in various organizations from uh, the American Society of Landscape Architecture to uh, uh, American Horticulture Society. So uh, really a, a great place to find myself. And, you know, I can owe a lot of that, who I am now, to mm -hmm. just being outside yes. and playing in the mud yes. as a child. Yes. Did you know there's an International Mud Day now, by the no way? No way. I, uh, it's sometime in June. Uh, yes, because I for our um, family consumer sciences around the table um, Facebook page, I write once a month and mine is supposed to be activities that you can do with your children. So I actually found International Monday and posted it because they had a whole bunch of activities about playing in the mud. Uh -oh. But exploring is how kids learn. Mm -hmm. So, and exploring outside is especially valuable for many reasons. You've talked to me about studies that they've done in Chicago about green space and the difference it's made to crime rates and all kinds of things. Just mm. amazing studies out there. Yeah, they can really show a correlation between you know, kids getting outside and better test scores, uh, even research going on at University of Illinois showing that uh, kids that have, uh, you know, attention deficit disorder, they get outside for a time and then it turns out they are able to focus better. Mm -hmm. um, they're able to control their actions better and they equate it to one dose of their prescribed medication, yes. you know, like Ritalin or something. Right. Like that. So it's, yes. nature can do pretty amazing things yes. for us. Yes. Yeah. Didn't you write an article something about vitamin nature or no? I don't think that was me, um, but I, I have written a couple articles on um, just the, the research we see uh, coming out of like the University of Illinois Landscape Architecture Department, um, what they're doing with uh, school age kids and the different exposures to like green space. Mm -hmm. And then they show how they respond to stress, like stress tests. And they show that the more exposure you have, the better your brain's able to deal with stressful situations. Yes. And so really interesting. And I would love to have you back on, you know, this, now this idea comes to me. Okay. I'd love to have you back on to, to talk more about how nature does in affect okay. our brain, okay. um, you know, and talk about some of that research going on out there right now. So I'd uh, love to have that on. But I think for right now, we're, we're going to switch over okay. to uh, some, some questions okay. that have come into the extension office. And so as part of this podcast, um, what we'll, what we hope to do, um, is, you know, have a, uh, have me your host, uh, but then also have a guest on, uh, talk a little bit about a certain topic. Um, and then finally, we're going to end the, the podcast with questions that we get from the extension office and okay. just a, a smattering of questions from the area where we're at here in West central Illinois. Well, as I look at these questions, I don't see the one that you answered that you helped me most with, which was hollyhock rust. So I have finally wow. conquered my hollyhock rust. Oh, awesome! Yes. Yes. yes, yes. Maybe a future show we can dedicate the whole thing to hollyhock <laughs> rust because there is a time of year where that's like all, the only calls I will ever get. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, again, now I have conquered mine. So, so this first question is a homeowner from Knox County. Ugh. 
Um, <laughs> needs information on the best way. Not Knox County. Yet. Oh, I thought you were knocking Knox County. I was like, oh my goodness. No, I was reading ahead. I was uh, jumping ahead. I'll put the yuck in the right place now. <laughs> There's a homeowner from Knox County who needs information on the best way to get rid of bagworms. Yuck. There's my yuck. Yes. Um, so bagworms in this case, um, it's where, let's see, we're August 10th right now. The window for controlling bagworms uh, in terms of some type of uh, uh, insecticide spray has closed. Uh, it's not a good time to spray. The bagworms, the, the, which are actually caterpillars, have grown to a size where they can become fairly resilient to any type of pesticide that we would throw at them. So right now through fall, winter, and into spring, the best thing to do is to pick off the bags on your plants and then what we want to look for in terms of control, um, we want to wait until about mid to late June. That will be the best time to uh, spray a product that contains the active ingredient BTK. Um, BT stands for Bacillus thuringiensis. Uh, so the mouthful, I know. So that's why they call it BT. Yeah. And K stands for Kerstachii. Um, that is a strain that only affects caterpillars. And so the bagworm being a caterpillar, you spray your shrubs with that. The caterpillar feeds on the foliage and they die. So, so that's the best time, mid-June to late June is that window for spraying. So I never really thought about, although this sounds late, I never really thought about bagworms being caterpillars. So what do they turn into? You know, I, I think they turn into like some type of moth, but I don't know off the top of my head. You know, I, for, for my side of things, I only have to deal with the the life cycle of the insect that is doing damage to the garden. <laughs> okay. Nobody calls me with, uh, gee, what's this, uh, you know, random moth flying around my light, okay. my back porch. They All always right. want to know like, what's this thing eating my plants? Okay. All right. Well, I have a, I have a funny story about bagworms and why I said yuck, because we didn't spray when I was a kid. So we had to pick them off of our, um, evergreens that ran across the front of our house. And I don't know how this happened, but so we picked them off and then we threw them into the trash and then, and the trash was in the dark. And so several hours later we opened and the bagworms had come out of their bags and were crawling all around the trash. Yes. Ugh. Yes. Yes. So, uh, just like picking them off and throwing them behind your shoulder will not work. You know, pick them off, put them in the trash can, seal that bag up or something, or put them in like a little burn barrel or something just to... Get, get rid of them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Never forget that. <laughs> Never forget that. <laughs> They're creepy looking. They are very creepy looking. Okay, so the second question I have here, it says it comes from Facebook. So someone must have posted. Yep, we have uh, our Facebook page, uh, Three Rivers Horticulture. Um, so anyone can like us, follow us, and uh, send us questions through Facebook. Okay. So this question is, my zucchini is alive and healthy, but not settling any fruit. Setting? Settling? Probably setting. Setting yeah. any fruit. What's wrong? Well, there could be, there could be a couple issues. Two things come to mind right off the bat. Um, first would be poor pollination. And that might be because they just don't have any pollinators nearby. Maybe they don't have any good attractive flowers okay. to them. So if that's the case, they can they can pollinate the flowers themselves. You'll have to identify the male flower and the female flower, which is easy because the male flower has just on a long stalk. The female flower already has kind of like this, almost looks like an undeveloped zucchini at the base of the flower, so okay. it's a swollen base. Um, so that's female. So you just want to take like a Q-tip, swab the male, and then pollinate the female flower. Okay. That's pretty simple there. Um, the other thing is if they're using insecticides, be very careful um, around those, uh, any type of, you know, squash plant because it does require the service of pollinators to move that pollen from the male to female flower to get fruit. Uh, so, so watch out for that. And the other thing is zucchini plants, they tend to produce an overabundance of male flowers and maybe it just hasn't started producing the female flowers yet. Okay. I don't grow zucchini, so I didn't know, but is it like my butternut squash that, yeah, it blooms, but then you can see like little bitty, looks like a little bitty squash on the Yep, on the end. you get the little little baby um, zucchini or squash type um, uh, kind of swollen area underneath yes. the female flower, and and it, and 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 zucchini uh, kind of like summer squash is one of those that if you're growing it um, and you're growing it well, 
you have way more than you will ever need. <laughs> You'd be throwing it at people trying to get rid of some. I remember you telling me, yeah, when I was talking about growing squash for the first time that Yes, I would be sneaking it into people's cars and parking lots. Like, exactly. Here you go. Here you go. Yes, yeah, so you come up, come to the McDonough County Extension Office, and Kara will put a zucchini in your <laughs> trunk. Yeah, last year's uh, squashzilla, as I called it, gave me twenty butternut squashes. Holy you need a lot of butternut squash to get rid of twenty you, butternut squashes. You gotta love it. <laughs> yes. That's why everybody got a gift of butternut squash. Ah, year, that's exactly. That? I remember that. Yes, yes, with a little bow on. With it was a little nice. Bow on it. Yes. Yes. Okay, question number three. A homeowner in McDonough County would like more information on oak wilt. It is killing her trees, and she would like to know a way to stop it from spreading. Well, that's, um, there's not a great answer to this question. To um, One of the things to stop it from spreading, I guess, that I could recommend is if you're going to be pruning your tree at all, don't prune it during the growing season, prune in the winter. Um, any wounds, any exposed wounds, um, you know, can then move the the pathogen from tree to tree. Say, as an insect lands on an infected tree and goes to your tree, maybe that you had just pruned, and pow, you have oak wilt. Um, it would, by the way, it only affects oaks, um, primarily uh, those in the the red oak uh, group. Uh, so, what does it look like oak wilt? Um, it, it progresses through the tree fairly quickly. Um, I've seen it a handful of times here in McDonough County. Um, and it, I mean, it pretty much goes through it, you know, within a matter of weeks, uh, watching it move through the entire tree and the leaves basically curl, um, they die and the, the, the limbs just die. It's, it's very sudden. And so, um, there's not a terrible amount you can do except avoid wounding your tree during the growing season, which, you know, if we get a hailstorm, it becomes all but impossible. Um, insects will feed on trees anyway, either, no matter what you do, there's nothing we can really spray or do about it. Um, you know, just maintain, you know, good sanitary practices in the garden uh, and, you know, check online. There's always more information online about that, that we could, you know, we could dedicate a whole nother show to this. Oh, well, okay. Well, yeah, because yeah, several questions come to mind, <laughs> um, but I'll move on. Um, Uh-oh, I think I know the answer to the next one. There's a homeowner in Warren County who says their ash tree is losing it, its leaves and limbs and dying off, and they would like to know, he would like to know if he can save his tree uh, or what he can do about it. Um, well, Warren County, uh, for the last couple of years, I want to say since 2014 or 2015, uh, we have confirmed the presence of emerald ash borer in Warren County, and it has been there for a while. So, you know, I, I wasn't quite sure where this person was located, but if they're in Monmouth, EAB has been there for several years, okay. even before it was confirmed, because the trees that we found were these huge, um, you know, 30, 40, 50 foot ash trees that were stone dead the year that it was confirmed. So it's been there for a while. Yeah. So it kind of depends on, on what type of canopy loss the homeowner has experienced so if it's more than like 20 or 30 percent assume at least half of the canopy is infested and the tree's probably not worth saving um, if they've lost half their canopy i would say the best practice is to remove the tree if they're only if they've only lost a couple limbs here and there they can treat the tree with a systemic insecticide um, to help uh keep the tree alive, uh, prevent any further infestation of emerald ash borer, but um, that's usually an annual or every two to three year application, depending on the product that you use. Um, and if it's a big tree, you have to have a commercial applicator come out and put it out. Um, so I would recommend for that homeowner, if they wanna to try to protect their tree, that's fine, but it might be a good idea to plant another non-ash nearby for if it eventually does succumb. Okay. All right. And the last question for today is from McDonough County again. Um, leaves on a plant, and it doesn't say what type of plant, are becoming transparent and drying up. And it said she applied seven? She applied... Yes, seven, seven. It's a uh, insecticide. Product. Okay. Yeah. So she applied seven when she saw them getting distressed. There were several small dots or circles that had a pinhole in the center, and these were next to the drying part of the leaf. So diagnosis, please. Um, 
I'm not entirely sure what that would be. Um, the the one thing to point out, it, it, it kind of sounds a little bit like Japanese beetle damage, um, but the pinholes sound more like it could be fungal in nature, because um, that's typically how a fungus would start. You know, you would see a, a little black speck on a leaf surface and that would just begin to move for further and further outward. Um, the one thing I would caution against this is you see damage on your plant, you don't see the culprit, but you just spray anyway. That's the spray and pray method, which I um, warn homeowners against. Thanks so much yes. for spit take. I almost got a spit take out of that one. <laughs> Kara was taking a drink as I said spray and pray. She, she thought that was pretty humorous. I got that humorous. one. Yeah, I like that one. Uh, um, yeah. So I, I would avoid that because it, it doesn't sound like it's uh, an insect and, and you, you know, products that like seven, which include the active ingredient carbaryl, um, while very effective for some pests, if you don't know what you're spraying for, um, you could kill a lot of other beneficial insects that might have been managing that, that pest for you. Um, so always, if you do have a question about what might be damaging your plant, contact your local extension office, uh, you know, check us out online. Um, and it's uh, just the best practice so that we can minimize the pesticide use in our landscapes because, um, you know, according to the U.S. Forest Service, the average American homeowner uses 10 times more pesticides on their lawns and gardens than a commercial agriculture farmer does. And so really? that's, that's a huge amount and um, a lot of it isn't even necessary, so it's a waste of money. Okay. All right. Yeah, I was going to ask, you know, you have this description, but how important is it to have the actual leaf or branch or whatever? You know, the, uh, very often what we have to go off of is just a, a description over the phone, but there is no substitute to having that actual physical sample in your hand. Um, be able to look at it up close, either get it under a microscope, um, or even, you know, going out and seeing things in the field, um, you know, when homeowners show us a picture of a tree that's in distress, they often show us only the canopy, where almost all of the time the cause is at the soil line or below the soil. Okay. So seeing, you know, the entire plant is, is really helpful in that case. So um, we do take samples at the Extension Office. Um, probably one of the best places to send a, a sample, though, is our University of Illinois Plant Clinic. They take samples, and if it's a disease, they can culture out the disease and give you a diagnosis of that. Um, you can find them online. So, uh, But other than that, I think that's all the questions. That is all the questions, all yes. Right. Well, I want to thank everybody for listening to us today. Again, our, our first voyage here into the podcast world. It was kind of just uh, kind of a get-to-know-your-host. Uh, thank you, Kara, for, for being welcome. here today and, and humoring me. <laughs> um, so... Uh, Without further ado, uh, thank you for listening and have a great day, everybody. Take care. Well, that was some interesting information on the impacts of nature and human health. Uh, I hope everyone enjoyed that. I again apologize about the sound issues. Hopefully we're able to get them adjusted a little bit of, in editing, but I am not a wizard at this. Uh, so I, I've done my best. Just, just know that. Uh, Katie and Ken, thank you so much for being with us today on this throwback episode of uh, the pilot show yeah thanks for letting us join and it's good to see you guys again yes thank you i learned a lot and let's do this again <laughs> next week <laughs> oh we shall do this again next week it's going to be episode number 100 can't believe we've gone this far guys this is nuts um we are going to be talking about uh, tree fruits, uh, probably right now with a good time for pruning. So we are going to have longtime recurring guest Andrew Holsinger come back. Also, we'll have our producer Wendy Ferguson on the show to talk all about tree fruits and maybe reminisce a little bit about 100 episodes of the Good Growing Podcast. Not the Greenspeak Podcast, as was said in the recording that we just listened to, the Good Growing Podcast. I mean, I don't know, Katie, Ken, is it Good Greenspeak, like one of the best podcast names ever? That's what I thought. Yes. <clears throat> Very good. Well, we'll just say we rebranded and we are going strong on good growing. So listeners, thank you for doing what you do best. And that is listening. Or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching. And as always, keep on growing.